Hello, everyone. Welcome to hang out at Nerd Out. It's been quite a long time since we see everyone. But we're super happy that we're here um, this time to celebrate uh, Women's History Month with amazing three guests that, you know, we're just super thrilled to have, you know, their women in hardware um, and amazing projects to share with us. So a really quick intro. I am Ginger from Hackster. And my two co-hosts, David oh, from- <laughs> I'm Alex from Hackster. I do video. Uh, interviews and uh, intros to new technology and also projects, including a companion bot that I'm building right now. <gasps> I'm David uh, from Make Magazine, uh, often known online as iShotJR. My title is community editor, but I do all sorts of things from writing stuff for the magazine, editing stuff for the magazine, doing stuff in the blog, hosting events like this. And uh, yeah, looking forward to today. Yeah, and we really, you know, started up this uh, community hangout thing you know, about last year. Uh, this is the second episode we're running this year, the sixth episode. And we're just really glad, you know, to have the community here to always share this moment with us. Um, so really quickly, um, a couple of things that's happening uh, right now on Hackster and Make, and we'll share like really quickly. Um, let me just share my screen here. Oops. <laughs> well, at least we Hackster. know the format that's cool yeah so um, as I said I'm the contest manager at Hackster and we do many of these um, global contest innovation challenge each year one of the newest one uh, we have just launched is called smart campus so if you know any students if you know any um uh, uh, any professors uh, who are in the university or actually any kind of school. Uh, it's looking to do something cool with school. Um, it could anywhere be from, um, you know, like um, uh, robots that clean your dorm room or, you know, go-karts, retrofitting go-karts or uh, food court cafeteria or smart vending machines. We're looking for new projects, creative projects that's around uh, those um those those scenarios and we are releasing actually in this contest our hackster's edu kit uh which yeah. has of different kids you know ai one is getting started with ai getting started with environmental sensing um and getting and getting started with iot these are uh kits actually powered by df robot so for those of you who are you know, like beginners, like want to build these projects. These are like pre-packaged kit that's ready for you to get started. And um, yeah, and so for Hackster, uh, watch Alex runs a our Hackster Cafe every week. Um, so if you want to stay in in tune with the heartbeat of you know the tech, we always she always interviews amazing people from around the world. Um, and yeah, and go to Hackster.io and explore. Now I pass and we want to see all your projects in the in the contest and beyond. It's not just about contests, but it is awesomely about contests. And all your stuff stays on the site for for people to explore into the future, so it doesn't just get lost forever. That's my favorite thing about contests. So I had to say it. <laughs> um, I think the guest on next week is uh, Carrie Sandra from Alpenglow, who uh, Claire was just mentioning backstage. Uh, she did a show with recently. Is that correct? Yes, next week's guest for Hexter Cafe is Carrie Sundra. I'm very excited. Uh, you know, I've gotten to to feature her work, you know, when we met up at SillyCon last year. But this time we're going to do a whole hour of an interview uh, and find out all about her awesome kits that she makes at Alpen Glow for people who are learning to solder. They're gorgeous. We've got some other really cool people coming up. Uh, and since we're doing a live show, my brain is putty and I can't remember them. But uh, you will, uh, you can definitely find out about them by following Hexter on Twitter and such. You can't see them, but Carrie's kits are all over my office on this side of the on the wall of PCBs over here. Um, so yeah, uh, for in terms of make stuff, the main thing we do is this here little magazine. Uh, volume eighty four is about uh, digital fabrication, three uh, D printing, laser cutting, engraving, things like that. There's also a little bit about AI. This little sub subhead here, AI curious. Um, so you can check that out on newsstands right now, uh, volume 84. Also makezine.com is our blog where we um, feature a lot of that same content. Um, 
and I'd like to uh, send people to our Mastodon at the moment. We're trying to, uh, you know, work on our building our following there. That's kind of our favorite platform at the moment. We've been having really awesome engagement. So I want to get um, everyone over there and uh, playing with us and uh, check out makerfair.com for update uh, for upcoming maker fairs, uh, the maker shed for um, all kinds of swag and books and magazine and kits. And uh, I wanted to mention, I just dropped the link for the Discord server uh, where we'll be having the after after party. We have kind of an after party <laughs> in terms of uh, the second segment of this event, but uh, we'll also be on the Discord uh, for a little while if you want to hang out there and ask more questions. Shall we talk Oops. about Arduino Day? Hmm. Sure, let's talk about Arduino Day. Yeah, that's tomorrow. Yeah, Arduino Day is tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> so, I'm going to be getting in a car and driving to Chicago as soon as we hang up here. I think Alex is doing similar. I will also be running to the airport with uh, my little robot parts trailing behind me. <laughs> I'll be giving a talk uh, tomorrow at uh, in Chicago and hanging out with all the cool makers who show up. Uh, Here's some sure. Arduinos for context. I got all kinds of Arduino stuff. Just <laughs> if you always. don't know what an Arduino like, looks like, there it is. We'll be at M Hub in Chicago, and you can find it uh, on Arduinos. Eventbrite, I think. Could be wrong. All right, Alex, are you gonna introduce our first guest? Yes, I'm very excited to invite uh, to the webinar stage, uh, Ellie Rose, who is the creator of Coco Press. So Ellie started working on Coco Press, a chocolate 3D printer uh, in 20, 2014 during an intro to engineering class in high school. I'm gonna actually pull that up real quick so you can see, even if, uh, she may do it in a moment. <laughs> Screen share. Here we go. Yeah, break free from the mold. Very uh, admirable advice. And so, yeah, Ellie started working on this in 2014 uh, and graduated from Penn Engineering in 2019 and began working on Coca Press full time after five years of it of being her hobby, which I think is incredible. Like you were doing this during school. Uh, Ellie has also appeared on the BattleBot TV show as part of Team Mammoth. And is passionate about the ways we can use 3D printing across industries. While not 3D printing, she sings and enjoys weaving, woodworking, and glass blowing, all fighting for trans rights across the US. That is so many things. You didn't even mention all the things. So we've got the BattleBots team uh, that you did mention. We've got your Twitter, uh, which we'll put in the description to the video when the recording goes up, uh, but you can find it right now, Eliana Rose 66. We got twitter.com slash Coco Press, and you can also find follow the a uh, BattleBots team, all kinds of cool stuff. I am so excited. Uh, you didn't even mention that you work on drones and things. And uh, also, ah, there's so much stuff that I feel like we could cover. And I'm excited to see what you bring to your talk. Please take it away. Thank you. What an intro. Yeah, I don't do <laughs> everything. Um, but I am excited to just kind of talk about my journey today uh, of, of making and, and all of that. So I'm going to assume you can all see the screen. I'm Allie. You already got a cool intro, so that's that's exciting. Um, so my story of making starts, I guess, from when I was little. I used to really like um, art. And what I think is really cool is being able to just combine different types of art together. So I have pottery, glass blowing, woodworking, weaving. And then I said, wait a second, I can put these together. So I built a loom and then use that to uh, to make more stuff. And I actually still wear belts that I made on this loom all the time. Um, but then I found 3D printing in 2013, and that's kind of when a lot of things changed for me. So I've been obsessed with 3D printing. This was the very first print I ever designed. It was for a drone, here it is. Um, and I was really fortunate enough to go to a school in 2013 that had a MakerBot replicator. They lent it to me for the summer. I tried to steal it, it was not successful. Um, but it came to 2014, I was in an intro to engineering class and wondering like, what could I build? I wanted to build a 3D printer. I wanted to build a chocolate 3D printer. And what's fun is that this is my original sketch for the printer. It's like, I'm gonna heat up some uh, chocolate inside a syringe. What I built is so similar to my original sketch from 2014 that this blows me away every time that I see it. Um, so this was the original printer. Uh, I was in high school in 2014. It was really fun. It never quite worked as well as I wanted it to. You know, you can see I made some things. Here's a Hershey kiss. Everyone says it's the poop emoji, but that's okay. Um, and the tallest thing it ever made was about 13 layers, but I was really proud of making this. Um, 
then I went to college. I was at Penn Engineering. I studied mechanical engineering. I catted a piece of corn. Uh, CAD is computer automated design. And uh, started learning more about circuitry, about uh, mechanical design. Um, this was an autonomous robot game. And again, woodworking, trying to combine LEDs, electronics, machining, all into one project. Um, and all of this helped me to create the next version of the printer. Um, this part is fun just because it's an absurdly large 3D printed part holder for, um, for this chessboard. Very unnecessary. Anyway, back to the printer. Um, I made a new extruder and was able to basically take what I had made in high school and really rethink all of the core components of it. And I was really proud of this project. And that was all due to just combining all of these different forms of making into one, you know, all of the different forms of engineering into one. Um, so suddenly I'm making bigger things. Mia was one of my best friends. Um, and I went from printing what's on the left to printing what's on the right. A huge improvement in, in chocolate 3D printing. Um, that was This was me. So I'll pause here for a second. And I was so excited to apply to my first Maker Faire in New York City. So 2017, and I brought the printer there. It did not print very well. I don't have any photos of it at the Maker Faire. It was a 90 degree day in September outside in 2017. And that was kind of the start of saying, hey, this is a cool hobby, but how can I turn this into a business? How can I do more with this? Um, so I'll go through some of these next ones slowly. I was not very good at uh, whittling down the slides to very few, but new version of the printer. This ended up being my senior design project at Penn. So there were six engineers working on it. I was working on it for my engineering entrepreneurship program. There were two business students working on it and we just, did crazy engineering stuff. Speaking of Arduino day, we had multiple Arduinos on this, some just to control the temperature of the chocolate, some to do other stuff. And everything's a mess with chocolate, but we had pretty darn good results. And so suddenly we went from the first version on the left, uh, the second version in the middle, and then we were getting beautiful vases on the right. That's the Julia vase number 11 or 13 maybe um, on Thingiverse. Um, so some photos of the printers next to each other. And I graduated from college in 2019 and decided I'm going to do this full time. I had at that point been to enough events and I said, this might not be just a hobby project. This might, this maybe can be something more. Um, and I guess I'll pause here again and say the reasons to 3D print chocolate are a couple different things. One is that you can make personalized uh, designs without the need to make a custom mold every time. So every single design can be different. And you can also build in textures that are just not possible to make with traditional chocolate making. So it really gives the tools to chocolate makers to do more with their craft. It, it adds so much to you know, the history of, of chocolate and, and allows just for more things. Didn't explain that very well, but hopefully you get the gist. Um, I moved into my space at the Pennovation Center and had a very small space at first, outgrew it very quickly, moved into an office, outgrew that very quickly, and um, just had a lot of fun prototyping. I think these are really cool pieces. This is a metal 3D print that I did on my Prusa in my, um, in my office. And basically you print with metal, send it out to get sintered, and that comes back with a metal component. So I kind of figured, hey, if I'm using 3D printing already, how can I use this to actually speed up my prototyping? So I was able to just iterate extremely quickly with rapid manufacturing, uh, with rapid prototyping, uh, some thermal images, samples I gave away at my very first event. Um, they don't look very good to me now, but at the time I was very proud of them. Um, some other just random prints. Uh, the first time I sold chocolate for Valentine's Day and did a lot of fun stuff. It's actually funny, this love statue, because that's an order I'm currently working on, a bunch of those. Okay, new printer. The pandemic happened. That printer, we, I pretend, doesn't exist. And then this was the first one that I sold. Uh, this was Amy, who was working with me at the time. Uh, we got on TV. It was a whole exciting thing. We were printing just the quality just increased with every single printer. Shipped a printer. It broke in shipping. UPS put a pallet jack through it. New packaging. All good. Um, 
Okay, so back to why do you 3D print chocolate? This was one of the first big, um, I don't know, uh, tests of, of 3D printing it for us. We could make every single chocolate bar differently and we could work with the chocolate shop to do what they did, they could do what they did best and we could do what we did best. So they had all the colorful bonbons and we made the bars. Um, also hot chocolate bombs, et cetera, fleet of printers. And we actually sent some printers, uh, we sold some of the first version and got to see what our customers were doing with it, which was really, really cool. And now kind of here's to today. Uh, speaking of the Make Magazine issue, that has the Voron on the front cover. Our new printer is modeled after the Vorons. We're working pretty closely with the Voron team. Brought it to events. This is uh, from Midwest Rep Rap Festival in Goshen, Indiana. And again, it's just, it's just really fun to kind of, for me to go back and through and see all these photos of how much better things have gotten. Fortunately, I don't have the GIF working here, but I can now print print in place gears and articulating things. Me joining the Mammoth team, uh, which was kind of a funny moment because I'd wanted to be on BattleBots for years because who doesn't want to build six feet tall, destructive robots? But it just happened. I just kind of fell into my lap and suddenly Coco Press is there sponsoring the team and we're on the TV show. Um, so I got to go to the filming. That was exciting. Um, just more of more printing. And then this is kind of my like piece de resistance. I can't speak today, but this is an articulating fish. It has, it prints in one piece. It has hinges and it can move. And so I think that just shows something that you could never possibly make with traditional chocolate making. And it's all just been enabled kind of through this maker movement, through the open source 3D printing community. And I just think from that first thing from 2014 to now is a world of difference. So I'm, I'm just really proud of it personally. This is the new printer. It's actually going on sale April 17th. So if you're interested, go to cocopress.com. Um, and that's kind of my story is is just a lot of my engineering and a lot of my making has kind of turned into doing it um, professionally, which is a really interesting shift from how do you do something uh, as a hobby, switch it into a full-time thing and still continue to enjoy it. So I, I've had fun just with new printers, with new uh, business models and just getting to connect with people and, and kind of share what I do. I think combining food and 3D printing goes back to how I used to combine woodworking and weaving and all of that stuff. Um, and making is fun. I don't know. That's, that's, that's my story. I have lots of random chocolates. I always get, um, always get to eat chocolate when I stay at work late at night, like last night. And, uh, it's awesome. I'm excited. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me again. I'm excited. Yeah. To share. So everybody, we've got these three 10 minute talks and then we're all gonna have a panel Q&A uh, afterwards. And you should definitely be dropping your questions for Ellie in the Q&A, just hit the button at the bottom of your screen. Ellie, this is so awesome. And I had to be muted because the whole time I was going, ah, <laughs> everyone in the chat going, wow, uh, every new thing. Do you have any other little examples of chocolate with you? Yeah, so I'm also printing, I just didn't know, I'm gonna shine my head left, but I'm printing a lot of these texture samples for giveaways for events. So this is just like the standard like slicer infills. This is the gyroid. This is lines, I think. Um, just some more bars. These are mainly what I've been selling. Um, just bars with people's logos in them. And then, I don't know. I have a lot of other just random stuff here, like reindeers. You know, what you can do with chocolate is print basically anything that you can with plastic, but it's edible. It helps kids connect if it's in a school. Um, and I just love watching people's faces light up when they're like, wait, this is real chocolate? And then they like slowly <laughs> take a bite of it. It's like, yeah, no, it's, it's real. <laughs> we got one more minute left before we switch over. So I want to ask, have you uh, thought about or made another, like a chocolate 3D printed chess set? That has been on my list for way too long for me not to have done it. I I really want to do it. I have the exact chess pieces picked out. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have that board anymore because that was a group project and someone else took it. But um, I want to remake that board with a chocolate chess set so badly. I just have to get white chocolate working again. Hell yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, thanks for having me.
yeah, I'm going to drop the link for Julia Vases in the chat because you mentioned that and I had to go look it up. So one of my favorite test prints of all time. I might do that sometime next week just for fun. Baller. So I think next up we've got Claire. David, do yeah, you want to take it away? Um, absolutely. Uh, when I asked Claire how she wanted to be introduced, she said, um, you know, I didn't know if she wanted her full her. name. She said to introduce uh, her as lightning emoji, Claire Danielle Cassidy, <laughs> lightning emoji. Um, so lightning emoji, Claire Danielle Cassidy, lightning emoji is a self-taught hardware hacker, maker, and open source hardware enthusiast. She comes from a background of running a small business, making and selling accessories and art at comic cons and sci-fi fantasy conventions for over a decade. And I believe she's wearing some of those today. Uh, currently, she works full time as a project manager for Crowd Supply, helping makers and engineers bring their open source source hardware to market. Additionally, she is this year's talks chair for the Open Hardware Summit. Claire is enthusiastic about the spirit of open source hardware and breaking down gatekeeping around anything considered tech. Claire, how are you? Um, hi. <laughs> hi. Uh, I'm my my view is a little funny, but um, so hi everyone. Um, yeah, I do. I've done a lot of things uh, over the last decade or so, and um, I've been trying to explain myself lately, um, and I find that that's best in pictures. So I'm going to screen share um, my slap together portfolio real quick to do a quick overview. Uh, these are some things that I have made um, from all the way going back to 2006 or so. Um, I started making things like jewelry and accessories, hats, feathered hair pieces, um, and glowing cat ears. Uh, and I sold things at Comic Cons and sci fi fantasy conventions because that just kind of fell into place, right? Um, that's the market. It's a fun place to make things in. Um, and I started playing with lights from a non technical background a long time ago. Um, and I just ran with that. Um, and I, I really love LEDs in particular uh, personally, but I've found that that's true for a whole lot of people. Um, and it's a that was a really good onboarding ramp for me to feel more a part of the maker community. So I come at it from um, an outside perspective and um, now I'm here. And so a big passion of mine is, um, I don't know, breaking down the gatekeeping, the concepts of what belongs inside of the maker environment and what belongs outside of it, um, because I kind of speak both languages and, and tend to on-ramp people both directions. Um, so a couple of other credentials, I uh, converted a TriMet shuttle bus. TriMet is the Portland um, metro system, and we bought a shuttle bus because they just sell them. Uh, me and a colleague years ago, and we turned it into a makerspace slash living space just to prove we could and to show people what you can do with small scale off grid living. Um, LEDs led me to solar, and I absolutely adore off grid solar. It's a really fun sandbox of learning about um, power uh, from small scale to large scale, but it all um, is understandable. Um, I have also uh, built a, a million little spaces for both my business. I was vending at events and in the tool bus and at um, events generally, I have created space for people to move through. And so um, at this point, I kind of sort my making mind around both making objects, but making environments and making, um, I was trying to explain this to a friend the other day, like I create machines like Rube Goldberg machines, social machines that people move through. <laughs> um, I intend for them to see things a certain way or to experience things a certain way. And I'm fairly good at it from doing it for so long. Um, so I have about 1 million projects, like a lot of us um, that I do these days. One of them is laser kick, which is a shop through which I sell laser cutting files um, because I've been laser cutting for so long. I know quite a few tips and tricks. And um, 
Alongside Laser Kick, I also run Laser Block, which is a um, mutual aid resource where we make laser cutting files, stickers, zines, and posters that we completely open source and anybody can download for fully free uh, Creative Commons Zero, which means you can even sell them. Um, so that's some things. Uh, I have recently started a camp at my regional Burning Man event called There You Glow. It is um, kind of my concepts of how I learned about a lot of technical electronic things through LEDs. And I think that's a really beautiful on-ramp for non-technical folks. Um, so my camp is geared around entirely that. Um, I give you the basics of addressable LEDs. You feel really cool. You want to learn about other electronic things. Um, breaks down a lot of gatekeeping. Uh, it was very successful last year. I'm doing it again this year. I also teach lock picking. People love that. Uh, and I'm into drones um, and a little bit of 3D printing, though it's not my strong suit. Um, I have implanted chips in my hand at this point. Um, I like to electric unicycle and I recently purchased my own rig to convert. So that's a quick overview. <laughs> um, on top of those things, uh, I am helping run the Open Hardware Summit this year. I was there last year on the team helping them run the virtual summit and this year we are in person in new york city so i have um helped with the talks and speakers both times but this year is quite a bit more because um, we're going to see each other in person we're very excited we're probably buying matching jumpsuits um <laughs> so uh related to a bunch of stuff you just learned about me i just created a bunch of laser cutting files that are going to be uh available for free in the virtual swag bag for the Open Hardware Summit, including the lightning bolts that everyone really loves um, and a couple of just open source, uh, open sources love um, and this resist fist that I'm very fond of. Um, okay, uh, one more project uh, I want people to know about is my um, handheld um, open source uh, light projector, graffiti light projector that me and a colleague developed in 2020 during the protests. And um, this is made out of plumbing parts, a Fernco coupler, um, a uh, lens out of an old big screen TV, you can find them on the side of the road, and a regular LED flashlight with a laser cut stencil. So um, when you slap them all together, it creates gobo projection that you can adjust by hand. Gobo means go before. It means your light goes before the stencil and then gets focused by a lens. Um, so this is just a, a kind of quick and dirty, cheap way of doing that. And I have a tutorial for this that um, is available through most of my links in social media. If you find me on Twitter, I have a whole LinkedIn that um, lists most of the things I've mentioned. Um, yeah, I'm working on an LED guide for artists and non-technical people. It's almost finished and I will make a big deal about it when it's done. I also write guides to solar and all that, but um, I, I think that's a lot of, of what I offer and what I do and what I'm made of. Um, I'm also very passionate about uh, boundaries and um, mental health. And so I'm also relatively loud on all of my social media. And um, when I talk um, about how I don't, I really try to reel in my um, sense that I should make tutorials for everything, right? I think that's a pressure that we can feel as makers, especially as um, women or femmes, we are assumed that we're gonna teach everything and that we like it. And I really try to pay attention inside myself to how I'm feeling, if I'm if I'm more burned out or less. The pandemic really burned me out. Um, and then I try to talk about these things, right? And, and I don't just produce these days because I've scratched that itch and I don't feel like I have to um, as much. So those are my talking points. Um, that was and, brilliant. Thank you, Claire. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> we're gonna you. have a chance. There's like through both through every through everything I've seen so far. I want to just dive in and like talk about each individual thing for another ten minutes. But um, I think we're gonna uh, switch over to Ginger and have her introduce her nerd now. Yeah, absolutely.
Thank you. Bye. And I'd like to let me introduce Jessica. She's the uh, inventor of Macon, uh, founder of Mission Control Lab, uh, passionate about systems where human ingenuity and creative problem solving come together. Um, as, a trend, as an emerging technology, she discovered that the experience of inventure, which is invention and adventure, that's transformative for individuals, educators, and industries. So through STEAM, we can embrace a deeper understanding of ourselves, our connection to humankind, and the relationship we have with the planet from inner space to outer space, LED to IoT, human to machine. I love what she wrote here. <laughs> Yeah, so take it away, Jessica, and uh, let us know, you know, what is this inventor and the uh, playful learning? Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for having me on your adventure because life is an adventure. Uh, so today I'm going to share a little bit about some of the stuff that um, I've done in the past uh, and the other those that have uh, inspired me. Uh, that joined me on this adventure, and I'm going to tell you a little bit what we're doing at Mission Control, and I'm going to end with a, a sneak peek of Arduino Day that is going to be in Chicago at M Hub. So I'm really excited uh, to share all this. So what is an adventure, right? It's invention plus adventure. So it's not the destination or the top of the mountain or the end result of the invention that actually moves us as people, adapts us, connects us to, uh, to ideas, to new things, to who we are and to the stuff we care about. And so InVenture is this, in my mind, it's a mindset uh, that we get to relate with each other on all the time. And I actually learned this um, being introduced to it from the maker movement and uh, showing up at different maker spaces and hacker spaces and saying, wow, I really relate to these people. And it's not how deep my skill set goes. It's not only about the vertical, it's about the, the, the horizontal of sharing that is uh, that connects us all. So I'm gonna show you a little bit today about what is Make On and InVenture at Mission Control. So first off, a little background is that I love systems and I am an artist. Um, and new media in particular, because I love to explore uh, materials, processes, and the ways that they uh, start and stop and can do things that they haven't done before. So um, when I was at the early part of my academia, I was really interested in the brain and especially about the, how plastic it is. So I actually got to study about dynamic systems, which is the relationship uh, between the hypothalamus, the pituitary and the adrenal axis. What does that mean? It means that it's your immune system, your hormones and your brain. And how does it change? And how does mindfulness in particular, which is the research that I was conducting at the research team, how does mindfulness change your brain? Um, especially like if you've been sick, or if you're trying to do something new, like how does all how do all of these things start to uh, make a difference in um, in everything, right? That inner space to outer space. So I'm going to play a video now to get that going. Let's see. Here it is. Okay. So. Like we talked about, you, you heard about what uh, a little bit about InVenture and about the HPA access. And so I said to myself, I really want to get away from the insides of people and get out into trying and building machines that could change the way that people are experiencing their time and the way they spend their time. So I worked on some menstrual cups and diaphragms to see, you know, how can we um, create things and products that actually adapt to, to people and make their experience better. Um, so I actually went on the product side first and looking at uh, lower limb amputees and how can we create 3D printed things uh, that uh, can serve uh, the longevity over time as you change. So I worked on some glass blowing. So it's so great. There's another person here that's into that. Uh, some 3D printing, some old technology with new technology, uh, and doing a bunch of different projects with like the BBC, 
Uh, I did a couple of uh, interesting Wired Magazine projects. And people started coming out and saying, hey, can you help me like prototype this product? Or hey, can you help me uh, create some curriculum for educating people about invention? And how do you get that inventor that's inside of us out? And so I actually started going around all over Europe, testing this idea of how do we put responsive stuff on almost anything, nearly anywhere. And this is where Make On, which is what you're seeing right now, started to come out of my mind. So I said to myself, okay, I need to adapt and connect to the global electronic ecosystem. And I also want to make the materials go more places and in things. But I really want it to be more about the experience and what we're doing while we are connecting and adapting to all these different things around us and the products that we have, but also doing it more based on the story and how the meaning and purpose is coming through the products that we're using and how it's creating this new story that other people can relate to in a new way. So I went around uh, Europe, actually, um, in five different countries and started testing all the different problems that were stopping people from connecting and adapting to their situations and being creative together. And so that some of that means language. Sometimes it means just like how well you can use your dexterity in your hands. So many the tools you have, the skill sets, the confidence right? So many different uh, elements that separate us when we're building things uh, with stuff that's new. And so that's why Make On started to take shape is that it doesn't just let us make things quicker and faster and smoother and more familiar. It lets us explore foreign things or things that are maybe pretend that maybe we just want to give it a go for a little while. So this is when um, I started thinking about it's actually more of a language that I'm building and less of a physical education tool. So it's more like an art material. So how can an LED, which I'll show you here in a moment, become an alarm system, become a heartbeat? How can we share these unbelievable stories um, through creativity and, and building physical things to re represent other things? And so that's when Make On really started to take shape and started be being more about the story building and the experiences that are happening on the table together. And so Mission Control Lab is based on this idea too, right? Just like in Apollo 13, when uh, the spacecraft is going out and the astronauts had um, experienced some damage on their way up there and they needed to make some adjustments uh, to survive and also get back to, to earth. And so what they did was they cleared the table, if you don't know the story, and found what they had around them uh, to get and make adapt it to the situation and then get them home. And this is why now I'm starting uh, to use Make On uh, the, this last year. Here are some diplomats from the Netherlands. And we're talking about, we're physically talking about ideas together mindfully while building and creating and, and having sensitivity, not only in our, from our bodies, but in these new bodies that we're creating. And so this, we're really creating a, a conversation here, like we were saying from inner space to outer space giving the moments um, to make meaning and purpose. And at the same time, oh, here's the ask. So this is the Astro Oracle. It's coming around um, over at Arduino Day. It adapts and connects 85 different boards. So that's Arduino, Raspberry Pi, BBC Microbit, um, Particle, BeagleBone, SparkFun, all these different boards all in one place. And, um, we're hoping that uh, soon too, that we can actually have a, an app that's gonna let people adapt and connect their adventure stories in one place using what they have. And that we're able to actually start doing this more quickly and uh, creatively together um, on this app that we're hoping to, to launch here in the, in the next year. But going back to Arduino day, cause we love this adaption connection. This is that friend I was telling you about, and you can pull out the shuttle and you can actually take this back to your computer, program it, 
do whatever you do need to, to add to it, change out the board. Maybe you want to use a, a raspberry pie or you want to use some Adafruit. Um, and then you can plug it back into the station. So actually I don't have a station up there right now, but um, this is like really great for on a table or on a wall where you want to just leave the thing or you want to do it together and have a little bit more social kind of circle around making. Um, so that's, that's what's kind of exciting about this LED to IoT idea is that we can just bring it back down to not even just being about the function, but just about the, the connection of this concept. So this is like an example is that this is just a little LED and, you know, right now I'm signaling this uh, happy, happy feeling, or someone might take this and say, actually, I'm signaling um, a please don't come near me feeling I need, you know, I need space. So there's really great ways to share space with people and let them honor their, what they're feeling inside uh, by using and making with uh, what they have and also new stuff too. So um, a couple of things else I'll show you is um, this is like a, an adapter connector. So you can see all the little like female and male ports and um, the Grove C JSTs. And so you can uh, use the components that you have and just make them a little bit easier to connect to. So if you have a disability that um, it, it makes it difficult to squeeze or something like that, it gives a little bit more space um, or maybe sewing, you wanna sew uh, your favorite components together. So that's really what we're doing at Mission Control is, is adapting and connecting and just making the space in between um, social, story forward, and really about the fun of putting stuff on almost anything nearly anywhere with, with the materials you love. Thank and, you, Jessica. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, that's it. And uh, yeah, and um, yeah, so we're just, here's another good example of a, of a little, little guy. <laughs> that's it. I love it. Um, so uh, after guys. the panel discussions, uh, which we just concluded, uh, the next segment is our, our nerd campfire, uh, where we're going to bring in all of our guests and all of our hosts and uh, just kind of have a panel discussion. Um, there's nothing in the Q&A right now. So if people have questions, I'd love it if you can load us up with some in the Q&A. Otherwise, we'll just uh, hang out and chat with our amazing guests. I yeah, think there's a lot of emerging themes today. Sorry, Alex. Awesome. I said, yeah, let's get everybody in here. <laughs> yeah, let's get let's everyone get... in here. I was so inspired by all the, you know, like all the all the talk. I mean, I, I'm always, you know, amazed by all the speakers we invite. But yeah, I'm just, I love the enthusiasm and just, you know, like all the blinks, you know, everybody blinks. It's uh, it's amazing. I now want to see what people are going to do with electronics and glass blowing. Uh, either or both of uh, Ellie and Jessica, would you be interested in sharing what you would do to combine electronics and glass blowing? Cause like you both mentioned that. And Claire too, like, even if you don't do it now, like you can have ideas. I would combine it with Claire's LEDs. <laughs> mm. Always lights, right? <laughs> I'll be honest, I haven't done glass blowing since the pandemic started, um, but I really want to get back into it because I really enjoy it. Mm. It's so it's so meditative, right? The material, it's like making its own color and its own glow. And then when it comes out of the kiln, it also it, it can take on its uh, the LEDs or some some type of source. It's really it's such a beautiful material. Totally. Yeah, I, I did just um, <laughs> when when you're known as like someone who's into LEDs, you get weird offers like come do lighting at my festival. And I, I did. And um, we there was an artist that had made these really big glass sculptures to put out in a garden. And we just mm. stuck simple LED spots underneath them. And that worked really well. Like I find that sometimes very often the brute force method is the, be the best. <laughs> right? Simple. Yeah, especially when you're highlighting something like uh, you can go complex when you're building something standalone, but also like uh, use simplicity to sort of highlight someone else's work. Exactly. Although Jessica, you took a, a simple flight suit and made it like much more complex and interesting in that way. Oh, I didn't show how it works. Yeah, there's a there's some there's some features. So these are all like 
without coding. And then this one actually gets brighter. You might not be able to see it. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to rock that at BET, um, the British Education Technology Show. Um, that's next week uh, in London. That's so, yeah, I got to I got to give it a little more pizzazz. But yeah, it's it's, it's ready to go. Thanks. Nice. David, you um, so one of the themes that I noticed was uh, people talking about LEDs as art, people talking about LEDs as language and a way to communicate and stuff. I just wonder if you could explore that. I'm wearing some LEDs today because, uh, you know, exactly what you're talking about. It's like it's, it's such a special thing that I want to communicate to people. I'd love to hear people's ideas on how we communicate with LEDs. I well, I think what I'm always communicating with LEDs is because a lot of the jewelry that I've always made um, is statement jewelry, right? Like it's so that someone says, hey, I like your thing. Um, usually the conversation continues, where did you get it? But sometimes it can be um, about a topic, right? Like fandoms was always like really motivating for me because it was a common language. Um, and that's why fandom jewelry was so evocative for me. So like LEDs, people really like to comment on them. <laughs> So it's an immediate statement conversation. Like people are like, okay, how'd you do that? What is it? Is it hot? I, like there's a lot of like misunderstandings about how they work. And I get a lot of questions about that. And then I get to teach people. Hmm. Jessica, yeah, not to put you on the spot, but I felt like you had some things that you were getting into as far as LEDs as a way to communicate. Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to talk about LEDs. Yeah, I think, um, so light, uh, it's like sparkly things, right? I think our, we're really attracted to them because of our brain. And I heard recently that it's because of sparkling water that our brain gets excited. Like, oh, the, there's water over there. It's sparkling. And that, that it like brings us joy from the like deep, um, deep brain programming space. Um, but I really like LEDs for time that you can see like in a gentle way, if it's time to move on to your next topic. Cause I don't know about some of you, but I am a, I feel the ADD, ADHD. And uh, I think the LEDs really help me to be like, oh, it, it's time to move, you know, it's time to move on. So yeah, I love that part of the communication. We should, we should make some for the show then, because then we could just have a little LED that shows, uh, that shows when your 10 minutes is about to be up. Actually, yeah, I, I've been my, working on a, on a thing oh. that's like that. Mm. Uh, like yeah. a timer. Or... Commander. It's got a bunch of different yeah. ones that do different weird stuff with your brain. So I call them mind altering gadgets. But enough about that. But we should I want to chat later. Maybe in I, the campfire I, later on, everyone joins. David, what? I just wanted to show that yes. I didn't notice this apparently died while it while I was hosting, but I just wanted to show off my little trans anarchy thing that Chipper Doodles made here. That's awesome. <laughs> Again, a statement. Uh, Chipper doodles. I'm I'm literally doing a project. I'm writing that project page today at Crowd Supply. <laughs> nice. Awesome. I'm really does look, excited. Does it have this on it as well? It's we're only. I think we're doing two of them, and I'm not sure yeah. which. I haven't gotten the images back from our. <laughs> yeah. Shameless plug there. <laughs> yeah. You I'm really curious. All the them to treasure. Sorry. Mm-hmm. There's like treasure everywhere in these, in these, yeah. <laughs> I'm curious about the business side of things. So both Ellie and Claire, you run businesses that have to do with making stuff. I'm curious, what, what do you use? Like, since you're working on physical things, what do you use to make your life easier when you have to make like a ton of something and you have to make sure that they all work or come out prettily or uh, as intended? I feel like I've been talking. Ellie, your stuff is so cool. I just want to hear you talk about it all the time. <laughs> okay. Um, I feel like when I've made a lot of things, it's mostly been chocolate. And so that I can just be like, <laughs> yep, looks good. Yep, tastes good. We're good. Um, I also, you know, I haven't, I think one of my big challenges uh, this year is exactly that. It's, okay, I've made you know a dozen chocolate printers i have three of the old prototypes above me here i have like oh. a graveyard to my left of like four old printers um and then i have a room in the other room of, of a whole bunch of chocolate printers too um how do i go to then making a hundred of those 
I'm not a hundred percent sure at this moment. <laughs> I have a lot of ideas for how to do quality control. I have a lot of uh, things I've worked on there, but um, I can't say I've I've actually launched the product with you know a um, hundred electromechanical things or however many I make. Um, how have they changed over time as you got closer to this? At first, it was just how can I build a 3D printer and like, let's maybe figure out some paste extrusion on top of that. And now it's really gone to how can we optimize every single part of this? What, so one of the biggest changes with the new one is actually not the hardware, it's the chocolate itself. So we realized if we can change the fat that the chocolate is based on, um, then we can make a printer that doesn't need a cooling system and that doesn't need to be fully enclosed. And that Ooh. made the price go from ten thousand dollars to fifteen hundred dollars, yeah. and it prints better, arguably, than all <laughs> the uh, previous ones. So anyone who bought the previous one, we're sending a new one to them for free. But um, oh wow, you know, nice. it's, it's um, kind of like where do you solve the problem in the chain? It's like okay, I want this thing to be more affordable, so like hobbyists can go get it, um, so people can play with their food more. Um, <laughs> And yeah, we really thought that we had to mechanical engineer or electrical engineer or do some crazy software for better temperature control. And turns out we can do material science work. Um, so that, that's been one of the big things that's changed is, is just like, where in that process do we, do we um, make the improvements, which has been fun. I just saw something in the chat, which was uh, uh, asking for tips and thoughts about building a community of women makers. And I wondered if we could It's a really cool that. comment. I think, tiger lilies. <gasps> I think I can save us time and give my hot tip for small business manufacturing and answer that question. <laughs> a little bit. Love and it, it entirely revolves around flexing, like deprogramming a lot of stuff. I think we learn and flexing your ability for lack of a more nuanced term to ask for help <laughs> from your immediate community. Um, we we're really globally connected these days and like I struggled for a long time to hone in on like the people in my town, the people around me who aren't necessarily like the shiniest makers of the people in my, my like hobby community, the people around me, I started asking them to help me make stuff for my small business because I could not afford employees forever like that jump between like small business to mid sized is cray cray and most people don't make it. And so I would like this also involved a whole lot of having to understand consent and clear communication to get good merch out of it and to make it worth it for people. I, it was very important to me that like, am I paying you? Am I paying you in, you get to hang out with the community and make stuff together, like, but be clear about it. I, I could talk about this for hours, <laughs> mm. but this has fed my sense of how possible it is to gather people together. It took me no joke, like two years to figure out how to gather people together and get them to create things that I could sell through my business. Two years. I sucked at it for so long. It was so, so hard. And, but I broke through like this confidence level and knowing what people can make as a group and knowing what brings people confidence and doesn't block them from wanting to try. That just took two years, right? So gather the people around you try to get them enthusiastic, figure out what they're enthusiastic about, trying to get them to do that together and just keep at it when it's hard. I think, I think. <laughs> awesome. Do we have enough time for another question from the Q and A? Oh, I don't wanna actually skip over anyone else who wanted to answer that previous one. Please. About building community. Mm -hmm. I don't have a full answer because I think it's a really, really difficult topic, but I think you have to be intentionally inclusive in spaces. I think one misstep I've seen people make is saying, oh, like we don't, you know, discriminate based on X, Y, Z. And that's not enough because you have to just make sure that. I don't, I don't know exactly how to explain it, but, but just really listen to people and say like, well, what does make an inclusive community? What does uh, allow people to feel valued, feel listened to, and feel like they can contribute? I think a lot of times in very vague communities, I think the word communities is becoming more vague as it moves into online spaces, as it moves into events. Um, how do people feel comfortable speaking up in, in those? And uh, what happens when they do? And, and um, 
what's the backlash if they misstep slightly? And so just, just being intentional, I think is really important. I, I agree with you too. I think the um, showing up is really important, right? And showing up open. Because I think that sometimes it's really easy to want to be a part of a community, but not really show up for like the changes that are happening in the community or like the learning that has to happen in the community or like the forgiving or the, um, you know, some people need permission, right? And maybe you could be this community member that gives someone else permission to be a part of something in a deeper, better way. So I, I love the, I think this community question is, is so, uh, it's, it's like one of the best topics we need, or everyone needs right now, right? Is to have that question on their mind. So yeah, I think that showing up is my, uh, my spot. And I just add real quick that I do think you like a hundred percent agreed. I'm not an expert, but I have years ago, I started Googling, like, how do I build an inclusive women's community or like things like mm. that? Just like the things that pop into your head that you're like, how the fuck do I do this? Just search it. And people have written beautiful things, far more expert people than me, right? Like you can find resources. This is true. Uh, we're almost at our uh, cutoff for this. I just wanted to, since this is something that is very dear to my heart as well, I wanted to throw in a thought, um, having been through uh, growing pains at a couple of different maker spaces, uh, sometimes there's resistance to the idea of adding a code of conduct. People are like, we don't need that. You know, we're not that kind of community, but like, and like people feel like it'll be restricting, but actually I feel like it, it's something that can really open people up because it's like, if you're worried about hurting someone's feelings or doing something that might hurt someone, you have kind of a guide now that will help you understand like what the process is if something happens, that it's not just, you're gonna be cast out at forever and left in the dark. And also like, it gives you guidance on how to not do that in the first place, which is great for everyone. And uh, so I've seen definitely some resistance from sometimes from from groups who were trying to implement that, but it's so valuable and it signals to people that this is a place that's going to be self safe and welcoming for you. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so what's up next, David? So, yeah, we are at time for this segment. Um, I just wanted to give us a chance if there's any other um, CTAs that uh, that we wanted to share. I know we're definitely a question, but um, maybe for the campfire. Or the, I grab the, the, the question. I, I grab the question, stuck it in the show notes. So we'll do it. We'll do it on the other side if that's cool. Great. Um, but yeah, we're gonna switch over right now. We're in sort of webinar mode where we like blast ourselves at the audience. But we're gonna switch over to um, the hangout portion of the event where we all get. To, if you're comfortable, you can uh, turn your camera on. You can turn your microphone on if you like. No pressure to do that. If you don't, you can still use the chat. But um, you get a chance to kind of interact directly with our amazing guests. Um, and uh, did you guys have any other uh, Hackster CTAs that you wanted to plug real quick before we make that jump? Follow our newsletter. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. It's full of good stuff and you don't have to miss anything. So that's one place to go for all the stuff. And yeah, uh, so in the in the comments, uh, in the chat, we've got a link to the Make Discord, which is a great place to go for the after after party. And right now what we're gonna do is go back to the Zoom lobby and you're gonna click into the other session 